Welcome back. Today we begin the last sub-series on the eight P's of the Gospel. Today we're looking at the peace of Christ, which is pictured in the seventh day, the Sabbath. Yes, creation was accomplished by the Lord in six days. He didn't create anything on the seventh day, but it is part of the paradigm of the eight P's of the Gospel, and with good reason. Let's go ahead and review where we've been so far. This is a cumulative series, so I'll make very brief reference to what we've looked at so far. If you're curious about those or haven't seen those, I would encourage you to look back at them. We're just going to cover them very quickly. If you remember in the beginning, the world was formless, void, and dark, completely undeserving of God's attention, yet the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And on the first day, He spoke light into the world. This is the presence of Christ. On the second day, he separated the waters above the earth from the waters below the earth, creating a division or an expanse. This is the plain speaking of Christ about our problem, which is the separation of God and man. On the first part of the third day, he drew back the waters from the earth, the protection of Christ from the spiritual chaos and danger of the world symbolized in the waters. And on the second part of the third day, he brought forth seed-bearing plants, symbolizing the provision of Christ, the fruit that he provides for us and calls us to provide by the power of his Spirit. On the fourth day, we see the celestial calendar in the sun, moon, and stars that pictures the purpose of Christ. These reminded the Israelites of scheduled worship events outlined in Leviticus 23. And the fifth day pictures the places of Christ. After the fall, these would become man-eaters. Uh, the birds of the air were always picking the flesh off of people's bones and the creatures of the deep were to be feared. This is a foreshadowing of the dangerous and difficult places to which God calls us to live, bringing his good news. And on the sixth day, the positions or roles or offices of Christ. Here we see Adam and Eve. Adam is holding a scroll symbolizing the office of prophet. There is a fire in front of them symbolizing the office of priest. And the crowns they're wearing symbolizes the office of king because the Lord is our prophet, priest, and king, and created us in his image to live those same offices. They're wearing animal skins because they could not uh, cover their own sinfulness, but God covered them after the fall by the life of another. And now we come to the peace of Christ, pictured on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Today we're going to look at the hermeneutic, that is, how do you know that this is truly what God's Word teaches? In the next two weeks, we'll look at the hope or the encouragement for God's people in very practical ways. And the third iteration of this subseries will be help for non-believers uh, or immature Christians. How do we bring specific uh, encouragements to them and how can we be helpful to them with this part of the good news? Well, let's go ahead and look at a specific passage in Genesis here that uh, tells us that this is truly about the peace of Christ, perfect relationship with God by resting in Him. In Genesis 2, the first 10 verses, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, which means set apart. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. And we can say that this is a gospel theme, that is, the peace of Christ. In John 14 we read, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You've heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I'm going to the Father, and the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. There's a lot we can say about what it means to rest in Christ, the peace of Christ, which is perfect relationship by resting in what he has already accomplished. We're going to cover some basics here. I want you to notice uh, one of the themes is the now and the not yet of God's peace. In the garden, uh, on the seventh day, we see a picture of paradise, and God is going to walk with Adam, and he'll soon create Eve and walk with them together in perfect relationship. The peace that Jesus talks about is both a peace now by forgiveness of sins and, and him uh, bringing us to himself through his Holy Spirit to be in relationship and the not yet that when he comes back for us and takes us to, to live with him in paradise of the new heavens and the new earth, uh, that will be a completed paradise where we are no longer in this flesh, we are in perfected bodies, all those who, who rest in him uh, and follow him. So peace now by forgiveness of sins and his spirit living in us to convince us of that relationship and change us. Perfect peace later in paradise, spiritually, physically, and relationally. Well, let's look at some specific pictures that represent this peace and how we know uh, the hermeneutic. This is truly what God's Word teaches us about the peace of Christ. There are four glimpses of perfect relationship with God, and one of them is the Sabbath that has no end. All the previous days in the creation week had an evening and a morning, but not the seventh day, implying that we are always to rest in God and His finished work, now fulfilled only in Christ. If you remember, the very first P of the Gospel was the presence of Christ, which is Jesus coming to us in His incarnation. Now the peace of Christ is God taking His people to be with Himself. And that will ultimately be in the new heavens and the new earth, uh, in the, the last resurrection when he takes his people to be with himself. But it's also happening now in him bringing to us by his Holy Spirit, changing us, drawing our, uh, uh, creating a new nature in us, drawing us to walk with him today in this moment. And the Lord considers it a perfect relationship because the Father views us through blood-colored lenses, so to speak, uh, he considers us perfect because our sins are completely washed away. So from his perspective, we are now in perfect relationship. And the sooner we can rest in that fact, the sooner we can uh, begin to enjoy relationship with him. And this is pictured in that Sabbath day that has no end. Uh, notice that he gives them the Sabbath, and then he gives them work to do. And then he, he creates a relationship, Adam and Eve, and he tells them to go out and uh, uh, populate the world and rule the world and, and live in his image as we talked about in uh, the positions of Christ, the, the last sub-series on the sixth day. But there's no end to that Sabbath, meaning we are to live forever now by resting in the fact that he has completed everything. God's work is finished. And we see, we see this uh, alluded to in Hebrews that we'll see uh, in just a few moments. The second glimpse is the tree of eternal life versus its antithesis. God walked with man before the fall, and the tree of life implies God's call to live with him forever, gaining knowledge of goodness as opposed to evil over time by a relationship of faith in him. So Adam and Eve uh, were to learn what goodness is and uh, by comparison evil uh, anything that is different from the goodness of God by working with God and walking with God over time. 
we'll see that specifically too. And as we've seen in several previous um, videos, the discernment of good and evil is not bad in and of itself. In fact, I'll flash several references here that show it's a mark of spiritual maturity. What was evil was wanting to gain that immediately outside of a relationship with God as opposed to walking with God, trusting in Him over time to learn what is good by that experience of relationship with Him. The third glimpse is rivers from paradise flowing into a fruitless world. Eden's glory, which was intimate relationship with God, was to overflow to all corners of the world by working with Him. And the four areas to which those rivers flowed implied life in worship, to the cursed, to enemies, and in blessing and or fellowship. All of the descriptions of those areas imply specific aspects of what it means to um, bring life or where we are to bring life. Bedelium and onyx were used in worship. Cush was later cursed. The Tigris ran through the uh, country of one of Israel's captors, uh, later would be one of their captors, and the Euphrates means a broad place or a place of blessing and implied the fellowship of God's people around uh, the Holy Land, the, the uh, Promised Land. So there's a huge metaphor here of taking uh, life from paradise into the world in all sorts of places and for all sorts of purposes. And the last glimpse of a perfect relationship with God is a man wounded healed and united to bear fruit, uh, that is Adam. But this is also a foreshadowing of Christ who was wounded, healed in his resurrection and united to his bride so that we would bear the fruit of his image in this world. So there are four pictures of perfect relationship with God in different aspects. We're going to look at some specifics of those right now. First, God's peace was pictured in the Sabbath with no end, always resting in Christ and his finished work. When you look at Exodus 20 verse 11 and Deuteronomy 5 15, both of these are references to the fourth commandment, which is the only commandment that changes from Exodus 20 to Deuteronomy 5 15. Freeze it and look at this. The first one, the motivation to obey the, first, uh, the fourth commandment of resting in the Lord on the Sabbath is that God was their creator. The second one is that God is their redeemer. So here we see physical reasons to rest in God. He provides everything we need physically. And the second one is spiritual reasons that he provides everything we need spiritually. He's the one who brought them out of Egypt. So we rest in God because he is the one who has already provided everything that we could not provide for ourselves. His work is finished. As soon as they were created, they couldn't give birth to themselves physically. They're already created. When he uh, brought them out of Egypt, a picture of spiritual salvation, we can't give spiritual birth to ourselves. We can't free ourselves from sin. We rest in the fact that God provides everything as creator and recreator, which is perfectly pictured in Christ himself. We see this too in Hebrews 4, verse 8 and 9. For if Joshua had given them rest, that is, Joshua who led them into the promised land, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever enters God's rest has also rested from his own works as God did from his. So the rest that Joshua spoke of is implying the perfect rest to come in the new heavens and new earth, but also the rest that God provides through Christ in changing us, a rest now by change and forgiveness of sin and a rest not yet in the perfect paradise to come after the resurrection. Revelation 22 also speaks of this Sabbath. No longer will there be anything cursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. This is a description of paradise, the new earth, and the eternal rest that will be accomplished by Jesus, who is called the Lamb, one who died in their place. This Sabbath is a recurring message that God has already accomplished our peace. We don't try to become something or gain something uh, that God has already accomplished for us as our creator and our recreator. The next glimpse of the peace of Christ is the tree of eternal life, knowing goodness by faith in him over time. 
We see this picture in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. This tree is a picture like the tree in Eden, and like a tree that we'll see later, that is drinking up the waters and, and is growing gradually in season. Now there is a blessing, there is a peace from God because of what he provides, and that peace overflows to others who can benefit from what the tree provides, but it is provided that peace from God himself, what he accomplishes, and there's an implication of knowing God by meditating on his word, a gradual um, coming to understand and appreciate and enjoy the goodness of who God is by his commands, his promises, and living those commands and promises, experientially enjoying the blessing that he brings both in personal transformation uh, and in our relationships and in his providence in our life as we live in him. Ezekiel 37, I will make a covenant of peace with them and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set them in their land and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place will be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Here he's describing uh, a rest that comes by knowing God himself. There's not a reference to a tree, but life and the, the uh, peace comes by his eternal covenant. And it's an eternal covenant, something that God gives by relationship with him, knowing him, trusting him, and that's where the peace comes now, and that he promises for eternity. In Revelation 22, again, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. Remember how that compares to Psalm 1. There the, the tree bore fruit in season. Now it bears fruit all the time and for our healing. The implication being that there's no longer suffering. There's no longer a lack of peace. There's no longer the hostilities and the hardships and the, the curses of the world. But there's eternal peace by the tree of life which comes uh, by knowing God himself and resting in him because the tree is not the focus. He is the center of paradise. And this kind of peace is the recurring call for the righteous to live by faith in God, specifically in God's word. Again, Adam and Eve's sin was not uh, primarily in wanting knowledge of good and evil. That's a mark of maturity. They didn't want to know it by relationship with God and faith in him over time. They wanted it immediately to circumvent relationship with God. That was their sin. We are to rest uh, in God and find eternal life by faith in his word, what he says day to day, what he says in his scripture, uh, what he teaches us uh, through his spirit um, and his word working together. The third glimpse are rivers from paradise, life overflowing by our work with him. Ezekiel 47 refers to this river flowing from a vision of the new temple. And God said to Ezekiel, this water flows from the temple toward the eastern region and goes down to the Arabah and in, enters the sea. And when the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. The river and fresh water is often a uh, metaphor or symbol of the Holy Spirit. And this temple was never rebuilt and and it seems that this was never meant to be rebuilt because it's, it's a supernatural picture. A river that's so powerful that it pushes into the salt water and makes the salt water sea fresh so that everything lives. Uh, it's an incredible picture of peace that God creates supernaturally by his work going into the world. And when Jesus quotes this, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a look. In John 7, verses 37 to 39, on the last day of the feast, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, 
the great day, the day that they were to leave their tents and go back home. Again, a picture of paradise going home to be with God. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as of yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So again, the Spirit here is pictured as living water that comes out of us for the benefit of others to hear the gospel. It's a picture of the peace that comes by God bringing life into the world, and we are to be a part of that by bringing the gospel to others, that gospel of peace in Christ now and to come. We see the same thing again in Revelation 22. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Here again is this picture that life comes from God himself to bless his people. And he calls us, as John, as Jesus said in John 7, to be part of that message now, bringing the peace of Christ and the message of the gospel to others. Because this imagery is the recurring need to take life into this world, that life, or the message of that life, is Christ and his spirit. And the last image is a man alone, wounded, healed, and united for fruit, which is a picture of Christ and his bride. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, and the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Here is a picture of a kingdom now. It's referring to, to David, although this is long after David's time, and an eternal kingdom that the Prince of Peace will accomplish. He will accomplish it uh, in the world, not here politically, not a theocracy, but uh, by transforming our lives and our relationships that there's a trickle effect in this world now, but ultimately in paradise forever in the new earth. We see this again in Revelation, uh, both chapter 5 and 21. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, and which are the seven spirits of God, and sent into all the earth, in chapter 21. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God and the Almighty and the Lamb, that one who was wounded, that one who had been slain. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. This is the recurring picture of love, Christ's self-sacrifice for others' life. There are many things that God could have used by his Holy Spirit to describe Jesus in Revelation. Uh, the king, the gate, the door, the bridegroom, the uh, prince of peace, but he calls Jesus the lamb, the one who is slain. Again, that picture of Adam who had his uh, side cut open and Eve is brought forth and then he's united to Eve and they're told to uh, uh, recreate God's image in the world. In the same way, Jesus was speared in his side. He died, was resurrected, united to uh, his bride, the church. And we are told to recreate God's image in the world by bringing the gospel, uh, his word, and through his gracious work of his spirit, he recreates the people. He, he gives rebirth by transforming their hearts. This peace of Christ is the blessing of God's people, both in greeting and goal. The Hebrew word shalom can be translated completeness, soundness, welfare, or peace likely because of God's character reflected in his law, promises, and his presence to enable those 
anticipating fulfillment in the Messiah or Christ. Messiah being the Hebrew word, Christ being the Greek word for the one who is anointed or chosen to accomplish this peace. Only Jesus can bring this kind of peace, which is perfect relationship with God. The Greek word, erene, may be translated one, peace, quietness, or rest, in the New Testament implying the same foundation and future. Because the reality of God's peace, which is perfect relationship with Him, is both now and not yet. This oneness or wholeness, this, this peace, even in the middle of difficult circumstances, because Scripture says that He gives a peace that surpasses our own understanding, this is only possible by the one who has chosen or anointed to accomplish it, which is Jesus himself, now in this world and not yet in the perfect paradise to come. This is why all the letters from Paul, Peter, and most from John begin with grace and peace. Grace is the means by which this peace comes. God's undeserved work of his spirit to, for, to uh, transform us and his son to forgive us by his death in our place. And the peace is the goal. Peace now in this difficult world and perfect peace not yet in the world to come. You can see here several greetings of peace uh, now in common graces of his blessings in this world and justification and definitive sanctification. You can freeze the video and look these up for yourself. Justification is the legal declaration of our innocence because Jesus died in their place. Some say it's just as if we had never sinned. I wouldn't go far as to say that because if we had never sinned, there'd be no need for Jesus to pay the price. But it is a legal declaration, his imputing or giving his innocence, overlaying his innocence on us and taking our guilt in his place. His definitive, or excuse me, our definitive sanctification means that God declares us innocent and pure and whole, uh, even though we're not yet. We're not yet pure. We're being made pure. It's different than his justification. His justification is a one-time act, but our definitive sanctification is a uh, continual status that God always looks on us as pure, and therefore we have all of his blessings in his timing and by his wisdom uh, that are um, ours because we're his children. Uh, much like somebody who is a citizen of a country, you don't become more of a citizen. You immediately have all of the benefits of being a citizen. That's a, a picture of definitive sanctification. We also see this in goals of peace, the not yet blessings. That's progressive sanctification and glorification. We are still being made pure in our experience of purity. In one day, not yet, we will be glorified and perfected. That's a lot of information. Um, what I want to summarize with before I kind of segue you to the next video on the hope uh, of the peace of Christ. Remember the very first P of the gospel was the presence of Christ. The Lord Jesus coming to us though we were undeserving. The peace of Christ is Jesus bringing us to himself in perfect relationship. And he does that now by uh, declaring us innocent by giving us his Holy Spirit as a seal to convince us of his love and promising to take us to a paradise of perfect peace in the new earth. Both are real now and not yet. Hope that makes some sense to you. Tune in next time. We'll look at the second part of this subseries, Hope for Believers in this Peace of Christ that is motivations or encouragements uh, for practical living. And I hope you'll join us then.